the soda fountain. It is the pinnacle of human engineering. It's a symbol of absolute freedom. In this singular device, you have a buffet of flavors, all waiting for you and you alone. And while most will just use it for their daily story or a quick hit of Mr. Pib, there are those out there who dare to go beyond, to think outside the tap. Those who question the one soda system and instead run down the line without a care in the world, blurring the line between Sprite and Sunkissed, having fun with Fanta, throwing in a pop of Powerade or a blast of Brisk. And so today, I I salute you, the soda jerks out there, the caffeine cravers who dare to raise a glass to every dispenser in this thing. May your drinks be sweet and your refills be free. Today, my friends, we're testing what it takes to create the perfect soda blend. And let me tell you, it is nothing like any soda you've ever tasted before. internet, welcome to Food Theory, the show that's the perfect blend of everything you need. Now, it's been no secret in my time online that I'm a fan of Diet Coke. And by fan, I mean I'm a hopeless addict to that sweet, sweet battery acid pouring down my throat. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being a part of my life. I appreciate you too, Matthew. Thank I you, know Diet you're Coke. addicted to me. To this day, one of my all-time favorite memories was being at a gaming convention panel in like year three of Game Theory, and all of a sudden the audience just lines up with this huge string of Diet Cokes right in front of me. I think I had like 50 by the time the whole thing was said and done. But you know what actually goes back further than my love of Diet Coke? Yeah, today we're talking about some deep MatPat lore. It's actually my love of mixing all the sodas together. Call it what you want. A hurricane, a tornado, a graveyard drink, a pop bomb, swamp water, or as I knew it, a suicide. Hmm. An unaliving yourself drink, I guess. Whatever the name, I think it's a universal experience. Walking up to the soda fountain and just running down the line. Going ham as you mix as many flavors together as possible to create the wildest, most unique, most delicious, and sometimes Sometimes most disgusting drink imaginable. That right there, that was my first true soda addiction. Hanging out at the old Taco Bell in Medina, Ohio with my dad. Each of us mixing drinks and then testing each other to see if we could identify the flavors that we'd put in there. But the cool thing about graveyard drinks, and the reason I wanted to do an entire episode dedicated to them, is that there's nearly an infinite number of options in making one of these soda concoctions. Over years of doing this, I fine-tuned my preferred blend to a science. But just because it's my favorite, it's not necessarily the best. So that's what we're aiming to do today. We're looking at the science of mixology to see if we can optimize the perfect soda blend, mixing the most flavors together to create the most delicious beverage possible. Are there certain flavors that blend together better than others? What other considerations play into a drink like this? And let me just say it now, let us know down in the comments what your favorite mix is, because everyone has their own, and I'd love to try them. That said, what we wind up concocting today, it's certainly something that you should try at home. Also, and uh, can I just call this out? I love the fact that I got done with a 30-day no sugar challenge and just immediately pivoted into this episode. It's like I gotta make up for lost time or something. Anyway, to help me on my quest today, I've got former bartender Santi on the couch joining me to run through a gauntlet of different swamp water variations so we can determine what elements, proportions, and methods deliver the best results. From there, we'll be using what we learned to concoct the perfect beverage in real time. Now, I've given Santi a lot of flack in the past for being a super healthy kind of dude, but this episode showed me a completely different side to him. So, okay, everyone at home knows my vice, which is Diet Coke, right? Are you a soda drinker? Like, what is your go-to beverage? I am a regular regular Coke drinker to the point that it, it was a problem. I had a friend stay with me one time for like a week yeah. and we went to the supermarket beginning of the week and I got a 12 pack of Coke and I had to go back to the supermarket like twice <laughs> in that week. Yeah. And he That's like, me. and I didn't That's realize relatable. it, yeah. right? And he sits me down at the end of the week. He's like, hey man, I think you have a problem. <laughs> oh, no, it's an intervention. Yeah, yeah no, it's an intervention. <laughs> He even he even texted my wife like, "Hey, I'm gonna have to talk to him yeah. about it." And so wow. since that day, I've been drinking Coke Zero. Okay. So like, <laughs> so much better, <laughs> right? Yeah, so much better. Little... Now, for those of you not familiar with the glory that is swamp water, the true origin of the stuff is a bit difficult to pin down. Soda fountains have been around since the 1800s, and it's not hard to imagine people trying to mix everything together from day one. That said, the swamp water references really seem to start appearing in writing around the 1950s. A newspaper in Paris, Texas, first described kids going down to the local diner asking for the Stuff. That's right, a newspaper reported a story about a bunch of kids wanted to mix their sodas together. Ah, oh, can you imagine the days when that made headlines? In any case, we can definitely track the rise of swamp water with the rise of youth culture in America. Makes sense. You think about the 50s and you can see the young rascals riding their bikes to their local diner like something out of a Coca-Cola commercial. In the decades since, the drink has evolved with the technological advances of the soda machine. More sodas and more flavors just mean more possibilities. But with the advent of the Coke freestyle machine, we're no longer limited to just eight or even ten options. We have all 
all the options now. It's honestly a bit overwhelming. It also feels a bit like cheating to make swamp water out of those things. So instead, today we're just gonna be sticking to ye olde soda fountains of yore with the different spigots, bringing us to round one of our journey, the basic blends. Unlike taste tests that we've done in the past on this channel to determine winning and losing drinks, this time Santi and I are really just testing some initial basic mixes to see what works and what doesn't when it comes to hurricane drinks. That way we'll learn stuff like what flavors complement each other, things like that. Then we'll be able to apply those rules in creating our own perfect pitcher of pop bomb. Take me through what we have lined up in front of us today and what we're gonna be doing. Right, so here in round one, we have four combinations approved by Burger King themselves, himself, the king himself. I, I like that Burger King is the purveyor of soda mixes in this case. Right? Cause, Cause yeah, we all trust Burger King, you know, that restaurant that we labeled as like the unhealthiest fast food in a previous episode, which you should click on screen right now to go check out if you haven't yet. But we don't have their food, so their drinks, you gotta <laughs> the trust drinks them. Are you gotta trust them. <laughs> food, hard pass. <laughs> so in these pre-approved swamp water suggestions by the king himself, we have the half and half, which is half Diet Coke, half regular Coke. There's the black and white, which is half Diet Coke, half Sprite. The four way, which is equal parts Diet Coke, regular Coke, Sprite, and Dr. Pepper. Then lastly, the black gold, which is one part Coke, three parts Dr. Pepper. And immediately, right off the bat, that simple half and half, it was a big win. It's a 50-50 mix, and it feels exactly that. Like, I get a little bit of the heaviness, yeah. where you have that little bit of sweetness that sticks on your tongue, but it's not as heavy and all-encompassing on my tongue as I normally feel Coke is, with a little bit of the lightness and, and the more water, watered downness that I tend to get out of Diet Coke. Absolutely, and, and I think there's a, there's a, a fruitiness to Diet Coke or, or that Coke doesn't have. And what's interesting about this one, and the reason it may seem simple, but the reason that we included it is because, according to mixologists, regular sugar mm -hmm. actually nullifies or counteracts the taste and sweetness of aspartame and sucralose. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm actually really, really enjoying no, this. No, I was gonna say, actually, I like this one a lot. The interesting thing about this first mixture is that the body processes the sugar in Coke and the artificial sweetener aspartame in Diet Coke in completely different ways. Aspartame is 200 times sweeter than normal sugar, and it interacts directly with the sweet taste receptors on your tongue, whereas sugar undergoes an enzymatic breakdown in your mouth, releasing glucose and fructose first, and then activating the sweet taste receptors. This is actually why people who taste regular sugar Sugar tend to report it having a more complex, well-rounded, complete flavor. Meanwhile, aspartame is so much sweeter than sugar that it gives many people what they report to be a sharp sweetness. Mixing the two actually balances out the initial sweet burst from the aspartame and then lets the vanilla and caramel notes from the regular Coke really come forward in the back end. So already we were off to a strong start. We were really looking forward to keeping that momentum going with the next one, the black and white. Okay, so yeah, just to clarify, so you're doing Coke and Sprite half yes. and half? And I'm doing Diet Coke and Sprite half Exactly. Half. But if you want a sample. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've, sh we've shared enough. We've bonded enough on this couch. You, you don't have mono, do you? No, I feel fine. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just COVID. That's no, yeah, that's fine. No, no, no big deal there. Wow, those two do not mix well. No, no. this is not great. No. <laughs> this, this is the, uh, the opposite of great. It's it's just dissonant. You you get the lemon liminess of it, but you also have the, the Coke that's mixed in there in in not an insubstantial way. No. And it just, it's, it's a bunch of competing flavors that don't meld together or harmonize in any way, shape, or form. It really is oil and water. So unlike Coke and Diet Coke, which blended together nicely, the Sprite Coke mix was just a dissonant flavor combination. And adding Dr. Pepper into the mix, it wasn't really helping things either. It smells very Dr. Peppery. It does. And tastes very Dr. It, Peppery. Yeah. Yep, it's all Dr. Pepper. This validates what I, experienced when I was doing this as a kid growing up in Ohio. Anytime I would throw in a Dr. Pepper, I would have to do like a splash of it. It would just be like a little bit to finish off the top, but it couldn't be a substantial amount of it because it just swallows up any other flavor that it's mixed with. Dr. Pepper is one of those sodas that people either love or hate. Very often it gets lumped into the category of root beer or cola, but Dr. Pepper themselves and the FDA both rule that it's neither. Instead, Dr. Pepper falls into the category of pepper sodas, with its unique blend of 23 natural and artificial flavors giving it a mostly cherry-like flavor. As the lore goes, the recipe is so secret that it doesn't even exist in one singular place. Apparently it's been split in half and kept at two separate safety deposit boxes at separate banks in Dallas, Texas. The doctor, you don't mess around, but I gotta say, after finding this out, some tells me that this is gonna show up as a food theory down the line. So we have the black gold. So this is the exact opposite of what you were saying. Yes. This is three parts Dr. Pepper and only one part Coke. Or oh, Diet Coke oh, in your so, case. so you're just drinking, you're just drinking Dr. Pepper at this point. I, I mean, honestly, yeah, I don't know why Burger King would approve this. Black like, gold. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, sure, fair enough. 
I mean, it smells. It smells like Dr. Pepper, and it tastes like Dr. Pepper. Mm -hmm. Can I? Do you mind if I taste? No, yours? please, of course. Because. Oh. Oh, this. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh, there's a big difference there's there. A, there is actually a huge difference. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That that one still tastes a lot like Dr. Pepper, but a much more mellower version. Absolutely. This is this is it's, a, it's so much it's too sweet. Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to drink that entire thing. Oh yeah, this is disgusting. No. So what we're seeing here is the exact same winning combination from the first mix. The aspartame from the Diet Coke is mellowing out the flavor profile of the sugary sweet Dr. Pepper. Contrast that to Santi's mix of Dr. Pepper plus regular Coke and you have yourself just an elevated sugar content. Hence why we perceived it as cloyingly sweet. Regardless though, it was immediately clear that a little Dr. Pepper was going to go a long way in these mixes and anything more than just a splash or two was gonna overwhelm the entire drink. So the big takeaway was to keep alternative soda flavors like Mr. Pib low. Instead, to create the perfect unliving beverage formulation, we needed to build off a milder cola flavor as our base. Now, as if this wasn't comprehensive enough, we decided to include a fifth option, which included equal parts of all the different flavors that were available at the soda fountain at our local gas station. I mean, from and, and, without even tasting it, just from the smell alone, a you can immediately hit a lot of orange, even though it's all equal. Anything with Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper won out. Yeah, so I'm hoping that this doesn't taste like a cherry Fanta. It's just Fanta. Really, you think that reads as just Fanta? Here, pour me a glass of Fanta if you could. So to me, I taste this one and it, it feels almost more creamsicle-y where I'm getting the orange notes absolutely of the Fanta, but at the edges of it, I'm getting that faint vanilla flavor of like the Coke. Okay. That's the one thing I've always had always had about like orange sodas. It's got a sharpness to it, mm -hmm. which isn't my favorite. Really? Huh, interesting. Let's Try see. this. Ooh, that is crisp. Who loves orange soda? That's a that's a that's a reference. Yeah, it it's is. Great. No, it's a great reference. Mm. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right? Okay. Yeah, mm. I didn't before. There is a lot more vanilla than I initially like registered. Yeah. I think about soda a lot. So this is, I mean, this is, this is my life. In short, what we were learning was that with the right mix, the addition of Coke was less about the cola flavor and more about the undertones of vanilla. And again, just like with Dr. Pepper, alternative flavors like orange soda really cut through the noise to dominate the overall taste profile. Knowing all of this, we were practically ready for round two. But before we moved on, there was one last thing to try, Pepsi. Lest I be called a Coke fanboy, we wanted to give Pepsi products their fair shake, especially because I grew up running this test with Pepsi fountains at the local Taco Bell. And that meant one thing and one one thing only, the addition of Baja Blast. Now, there's good news and bad news with this one. Bad news, Baja Blast has been for the past 20 years a Taco Bell exclusive. The good news, though, is that for the 20th anniversary of the drink this year, they've decided to release it in stores. So, you know, there wasn't really any bad news there at all. In short, it means that we were able to create the ultimate mix of Pepsi flavors that you could get from the fountain. And it was... Eh. Pepsi throws an entirely new angle into this because Pepsi products, for as much as they're competitors to Coke, are vastly different. Oh, in yeah. insanely so. Yeah, like to me, I actually prefer, prefer the flavor of regular Pepsi to Diet Pepsi, and I prefer the flavor of Diet Coke to regular Coke. I can see that, yeah. Diet Pepsi tastes off to me always. Yes, yeah, it feels synthetic, or it feels like a diet soda. Yeah. It feels artificial in a way that Diet Coke doesn't, even though, even though all of this is literally, you're just drinking battery acid. <laughs> let's, let's call a spade a spade. My gut biome is dying as we speak. The flora and fauna that exists to give me healthy digestion is slowly keeling over and dying. It had a month of sugar-free living without sodas, and it's like, yay, look at me, I'm blossoming. Matt's gonna be healthy again for 2024. And it's like, nope, we still got episodes of Food Theory to do. Just die, die on the vine, and it is. No. And See, Matt, right no, it, it, it gets strong. It's tempered <laughs> in raw sewage. Yeah. That is my stomach. This is this is nothing. Ah, oh, famous last words. Yeah, this smells terrible. <laughs> it's like, unlike all the other ones where I'm like, oh, this smells like a little bit caramely or a little bit vanilla-y or like Dr. Pepper. No. This smells terrible. Oh my God. That is not good. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> what? Wow. What? Oh, that is disgusting. <laughs> That's not good. Oh, this is wild. How vastly different and 
vastly inferior this is. Yeah, this drink, it was not great. Somehow this mixture of some of the sweetest sodas on the market ended up with a surprising mixture of bitterness and sourness. There was really nothing redeeming about it. Turns out this boils down to the citric acid. You see, where Coke uses phosphoric acid to add acidity to their soda, Pepsi uses citric acid. This is what gives Pepsi the refreshing taste that they like to tout, but unfortunately it's compounded by the citric acid in the Starry and the Sunkist as well. So the end result is just sour and bitter, whereas the phosphoric acid in Coke actually helps to balance out the citric acid in things like Sprite and Fanta, delivering an overall more enjoyable experience. Needless to say, we decided to scrap most of our Pepsi products before moving forward. With round one over, it was time to look at specialized mixes in round two. We narrowed down the field from six different drinks to three, each a different person's preferred method of swamp water. First up was a mixologist's advanced method that Santi found in his research, which took a wide range of flavors but really emphasized the order in which the drinks were poured. This seemed like it would make no difference at all, since it all mixes together anyway, but the idea behind it is to have more sugar-dense sodas sitting lower at the bottom while the lighter sugar sodas sit at the top. Why would you possibly want to do that? Well, supposedly it causes different flavors to hit your tongue in a specific order, leading to an overall more complex flavor profile that evolves as you drink. And that's something that we've actually seen happen on this channel before, in one of my all-time favorite episodes, in fact, the burger stacking episode, where we discovered that the exact same ingredients put in a different order gave you a completely different taste experience. So, if it worked for the burgers, maybe it could also work for soda. Also, from this point forward, let's play a little game, shall we? In our effort to be soda sommeliers, Santi and I did a fair bit of riffing off of classic wine tasting tropes. So go ahead, make your own swamp water, then take a sip anytime we say the word forward. See how many gallons of soda you make it through. Also, let us know in the comments how many times we said it, because uh, I'm not going to keep track. Ready? Go. I mean, it's a fruit cocktail. It's very different from round one, because this is a very fruit forward beverage, as opposed to all the ones that we had in round one, which tended to be much more Coke, Diet Coke facing. It is a very pleasant fruit punch. I understand why someone at a bar mm -hmm. and who works as a mixologist would find a lot of success with this. If I'm going for a graveyard drink, unaliving myself beverage, whatever, I'm looking for more of a cola forward one. This isn't hitting that but it's a very good version of a very different type of drink. Already you could tell that there was a more sophisticated, complex flavor profile in this drink. This was the first time that we were really getting hit with different notes at different times, even if they were mostly fruit-based. In short, the layering technique actually worked. Despite being equal parts of all the different drinks, the Coke at the top really made it take a backseat to the heavier drinks that hit our palate first. It's cool to get this perspective, because like I said, my beverages, whenever I would do this, always had a very specific kind of flavor profile to them, and I would just kind of like crank things here or there to kind of try to optimize it. I would try to emphasize like more of the colas, the caramels, the vanillas, not the fruit. And and this is a very good version that like dials up the fruit, which is cool. Right, which which makes sense, right? Mixologists, just like chefs or anything, they're trying to give you the whole package in, in what you consume. It's really light, it's really refreshing, yeah. and cover your ears, kids. It kind of tastes like a Long Island iced tea. <laughs> Over your ears, kids. Yeah, earmuffs. Clearly, Santi became real familiar with all different types of drinks in his research for this episode. So where'd you find this? When you say mixologist recommended, did you just go to a bar and like, hey, what do you do? Or like, did you find this online? Or what is this? Yes, I did a lot of research by going to a variety of bars mm -hmm. and just asking them to make me drinks. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we actually <laughs> into it. <laughs> it, was, it was a rough week of research <laughs> yeah. for Santi. He wasn't responding to emails. We found him in the gutter somewhere. It's like, I, I got it. I got the perfect mix. Honestly, you gotta admire the commitment to the craft. But now, with a new variable at play, it was time to taste my personal mix. In general, I tend to like my unaliving beverages skewing more heavily towards the cola flavors. So I split it up with a two-thirds, one-third ratio. On the bottom, two-thirds is an even mix of Diet Coke and Coke. The top third is Sprite with just a little splash of root beer and Dr. Pepper thrown in at the end to keep it from overpowering everything else. Gotta say, I am tremendously proud of this mixture. I've been drinking it for literal decades, but never really served it to anyone else. It felt like I was standing up naked in front of the class. Can't wait to judge you. I know, right? I'm, I'm actually very nervous. I've never had anyone else ever sample this. Mm. I can <laughs> judge myself, obviously, but you know, I lay myself at your feet, Santi. So this is interesting for me because I think Dr. Pepper, I'm learning here, needs ice mm -hmm. because it's really mellowed it out. And I'm getting the sweetness of Coke, but that's it. It's, it's very, Coke forward. Agree to disagree there, Santi. Maybe your palate just isn't refined enough. The one thing I will say, to my credit, just to defend myself, I actually get the vanilla notes 
more out of this than I do in any of the other ones so far. I will agree with that, absolutely. As a guy who's always loved the flavor of vanilla, one thing I never realized was that my preferred mix here really highlights those notes from the Coke and the root beer. By using Diet Coke as a key part of the base, it negated the sugar that was coming in from the regular Coke and the Mr. Pib. This then allows the more complex flavors of vanilla and caramel to take center stage. I like that it hits different notes at different times. Like it's vanilla forward, you get a little bit of the root beer in the back towards the end of the sip, some of that Coke in the middle, with just the like tiniest hint of the, the Sprite around the edges. This was, it hits you and that's it. It's a very good flavor, very cohesive, but once you taste it, that's, that's it, goes down, nothing more. <laughs> Here, it's what you're saying. There are those waves. For me, a much more enjoyable experience. Now you're just sucking up to me. A little bit, but kudos. <laughs> Santi's butt kissing aside, I loved my mix. I still love my mix. And I stand by the fact that it was the most complex layered drink that we'd had up to this point. That said, while we disagreed about the overall flavor, we did agree on some major factors here. One, ice is a huge difference maker. Two, layering does work. And three, Coke and cola flavors add more overall complexity for a more enjoyable experience. So long as they're not Pepsi. The bitter rivalry between the two continues. And hey, if you want to see some of the weird history behind these two, make sure you check out our Soda Pop Conspiracy playlist after you're done here. We've done a lot of episodes about both of these products and also how they don't get along all that well. But as far as swamp water goes, there was still one more that we had to test for this particular round. I'm not the only one being judged in this episode. Uh, <laughs> Sam, our Michigan grandpa behind the scenes, he has also laid himself at our feet to be judged. Come defend your uh, mixture here. So what do you got? So traditionally, this should be made with Wendy's High C Fruit Punch from the fountain. So I was addicted to that, but I also was a fiend for the fizz. Yeah. Right? The fizzler, the, if you will. The fizzler, <laughs> the fizz fiend. I have been kneecapped in this experiment. Oh. I am the Tanya Harding of today. <laughs> I, I, Tanya, and I was given Mountain Dew Code Red. Oh, okay. And so I had to invert my proportions because the Mountain Dew is so much sweeter to me than a traditional Sprite. And the High C Fruit Punch was a lot more mellow. To say High C Fruit Punch is <laughs> mellow is one of the most insane things I've ever heard anyone utter. So this is now one cup Sprite, one eighth cup, plus one sixteenth cup of Mountain Dew Code Red. <laughs> Did you not add your fraction? I was a film major. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! If you would never ask Da Vinci what fraction of blue is in this painting. For those of you who might not be aware, this is the man that studies our analytics on a regular basis, delivering a monthly report of our numbers. Guess I'll be double checking those from now on. In any case, the Sam Special was a very tasty drink, but as far as the assignment went, it was just two ingredients, so it wasn't really hitting the mark for what we were going for with the swamp water. That said, it did give us more insight into just how weak Sprite is as a flavor when mixed in with something stronger like Dr. Pepper or Mountain Dew. When it comes to Schlorps, I don't know, I'm gonna make up names now. Instead of swamp water, we should call it Shrek water. Shrek water. Uh, Shrek, yeah, Shrek, Shrek water. Shrek water. Yeah, the sugar definitely starting to hit us at this point. Which meant that it was finally time to take everything that we'd learned and create in real time our ultimate mixture. So I can tell already that there's gonna be some comments down below about the fact that we had to use bottled sodas to make our Shrek water. Obviously, plastic bottles, as we've established in previous episodes, are the inferior way of drinking soda. But but just by the nature of this challenge, we couldn't take all our camera equipment into a McDonald's or Taco Bell to do these tests on the spot. So in order to maintain the quality of carbonation and flavor for all the sodas across the board, we decided to stick to the standardized bottle for the experiment. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. You may still be mad at me. I'm, I'm curious, kind of like, what is your strategy going into this? What's your aim? My gears have been turning here because I'm trying to remember everything that we've learned over the past two rounds. You know, obviously we have ice because we can just universally agree ice made everything a lot better. I think... From a base standpoint, I want to have mostly cola mm -hmm. or dark sodas. I think Dr. Pepper and Coke are really going to be the, the core foundation of the best swamp water drink. Okay. And then in that final you know, quarter, whatever, the rest is where the playground will happen. In the true spirit of this challenge, the more sodas that you're able to cram into your formulation, the better, right? right? Because that is the essence of this, right? Going down the line, figuring out like what combination of three or more sodas really gives you that like very unique flavor that you can only get through this style of drink. Now, Santi and I ended up going in with very similar strategies. Having learned in previous rounds that order of poor matters, we both had to map out our flavor experiences precisely. In the end, we both kept the stronger flavor 
flavors like Fruity Fantas, Spicy Dr. Peppers, and Punchy Root Beers at the bottom. As for the rest, well, that's where our proportion started to differ. Yours is much more root beer forward though than mine is. Because I've incorporated everything except for Diet Coke, Coke, and then I could probably add a bit more Sprite to it. I'm regretting it because I put the root beer now at the top. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I really need to drown that out. What I'm gonna do is actually start with Diet Coke and see how that interacts with everything else. As we kept mixing and pouring and testing, we kept seeing one element come up over and over again as making the most difference. Huh, the pour order is making a pretty substantial difference. 100%. The more I like play with it, yeah. the more I'm surprised by this. It's funny because now that I've poured the Coke and Diet Coke, the root beer that was very root beer forward is now starting to fall yeah. to the back of the mouth, which I really, really like. But I think I messed up because I don't think Sprite should go at the top. Right, you really have to plan this out. And now that I've mixed them all together like I just did, it's too dissonant. I don't like it. What we learned throughout this process is that swamp water is a very delicate balancing act. Just a bit too much of one flavor or a flavor poured out of order can throw the entire thing out of balance. But right before we were starting to lose hope, Santi pulled out what he was hoping would be the trump card. A new challenger appeared, and its name was Powerade. I'm gonna throw us a curveball. Okay. Something that you don't see on every soda fountain, so we didn't include it, mm -hmm. but you will sometimes, and yeah. that, it's huh. Powerade. And it's, it is always blue. You know what? I don't think that's a mistake. Yeah. I think that is a sign from the Swamp Water, Shrek Water, Graveyard Drink, Pop Bomb Gods. Wow, well done. I know, right? You're like a little Dr. Seuss with those. It's all the sugar that's coursing through my right? <laughs> <laughs> right on! I gotta say I was pretty skeptical. How could some flavored water be the maker or breaker of our Pop Bombs? But from a scientific perspective, it made sense. When you break it down, the problem with Graveyard Drink is that it quickly becomes overpoweringly sweet. Sweet cola plus sweet other cola equals just more sweetness. That's why the Diet Coke and Ice wound up being so important in all these mixes. They lighten up the flavor and mellow out that sweetness. But one other way of balancing out the flavor is by mixing in something that isn't just pure sugar. The Powerade being full of electrolytes adds in a light saltiness to the mix, counterbalancing the top portion of sweet and acidic Coke. The Powerade makes a difference. It makes a really big difference. Yeah, here. Here, sign me up. Ooh, that is very Powerade forward. Like, it is. In smelling it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is Powerade. It is. But not when you taste it. It also looks mildly greenish. A little gang gangrenous. If you wanted swamp water, it looks a bit like swamp water for sure. Yeah. Wow. This to me tastes like drinkable cotton candy with vanilla notes in it. It's kind of delicious. It's kind of good. I kind of love this. Right? It's really good. It merges really well. It's a complex flavor, which I like, and it doesn't feel like especially heavy. Yeah, I, I think my final verdict on this, finish it off with Sprite, Coke, and Diet Coke. That is my swamp water. So there you have it. We cracked the code to swamp water. All it took in this balancing act was one final element of salty blue to tie it all together. In short, Santi's mix, which shall henceforth be known as the Santi Supreme, was one part Dr. Pepper, followed by splashes of Baja Blast, Code Red, and Fanta, one part blue Powerade to round out the fruity flavors, followed by Sprite, Coke, and Diet Coke in that order for the ultimate swamp water flavor experience. The most important lesson, though, at the end of the day is that poor order matters the most, followed by proportions, then complementary flavors, and finally the temperature of your drink. With those elements at your disposal, you can go forth and find your favorite way of making your own graveyard drink or hurricane or unaliving yourself beverage. So what I would encourage you guys to do down in the comments below is do you have your own equivalent of the Sam Special or the Matt Pat Mix? The Matt Pat Mix! Probably should have thought of that in round two, but Better late than never, I suppose. Maybe we could work it in the VO. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, do you have your own version of the swamp water, the graveyard drink, the unaliving yourself beverage? Let us know down in the comments below, and who knows, we might follow up in a short, or Santi might do a whole other episode about it. I think we've given you the tools and some rough guidelines to kind of optimize your next soda fountain order. So I think that's it for me. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me, the sheer volume of sugar that I just consumed after a month without sugar is making me go a little bit crazy. So I'm gonna go and process the sugar that's coursing through my body. <laughs> and as always, my friends, remember, it's just a theory. A food theory! Bottoms up. And hey, if you like this video and want to check out some more of our soda-centric episodes, we're trying something new here. It's a bit of an experiment that we want you to take part in. Click the link that you see on screen right now. It looks like a subscribe button, but it's not. Actually, it's just going to take you to the channel page, which is very neutral. Once you're there, play around. We're running an experiment. I can't tell you what it is because I don't want to affect the results. I'll play around, and in a couple weeks, I'll fill you in on the numbers.